I'm Dr. William Postma. I am an orthopedic trained sports medicine surgeon here at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. The vast majority of patients I see are young, active individuals, anywhere from the teenage crowd up into the active 40, 50 year olds crowd. They're patients that are affiliated with sports. They want to get back to being affiliated with sports. Um, I think today you see a population that uh, is trying to stay more and more active as we get older. So they're essentially trying to stay young and those are a lot of the patients I see. The most common injuries kind of depend on which part of the body you're talking about. It's for the knee, the most common injury I see is probably an ACL tear. Uh, I also see meniscal tears and other ligament injuries or uh, patella patients. With the shoulder, the most common injuries are rotator cuff tears and shoulder dislocations. With hip, which is one of the things I really specialize in, it's hip labral tears, hip impingement. I specialize essentially in arthroscopy, so that's knee, shoulder, and hip arthroscopy doing big cases through small incisions. So basically, with the technology these days, uh, we're able to do much bigger surgeries through these small incisions with uh, little cameras and different instrumentation. So I specialize in arthroscopy around the hip, knee, and the shoulder. Arthroscopy is, is, is where everything's going these days, basically smaller incisions, and we're able to do a lot with them. Here at MedStar Georgetown, we have specially trained orthopedic surgeons in every, every field, not just sports medicine, but within sports medicine, there's every facet that's covered. Our, the therapists that we have here are excellent. The, our supporting staff is excellent. It's the same staff, essentially, that we use down for the Georgetown University athletic teams. So everybody here is not only specially trained, but really top of the line specially trained. Although I do specialize in surgery and hip arthroscopy, most of the patients that come see me are not, do not need surgery. And I send most of those patients to physical therapy. I would estimate 90% of those get better with non-operative measures and never need surgery. Orthopedics is very attractive to me, or at least when I was going through um, medical school residency because I'm very active myself and I think living a healthy active lifestyle is important from all aspects. Seeing patients that before could not do these activities were very important to them and then the vast majority afterwards are able to do everything they want to do and uh, in that patient population that wants to get back to that, that's very important to them and so it's, uh, I mean seeing a patient, seeing a happy patient uh, really makes me happy. The hip is a ball and socket joint, just to break it down. With the, it's called your acetabulum being your socket and your femoral head being the ball. And the vast majority of injuries occur at the, it's called the chondral labral junction, where the cartilage in the um, socket meets this structure called the labrum. The labrum is this thick fibrous structure that goes all the way around the top of the socket. So if you think about the socket as being a bowl and you're looking down into the bowl, the labrum is a thick rubber band type structure that goes all the way around the top of it. And it's essentially the function of it is to act as uh, some stability, some nutrition, some protection of the cartilage, but also as a suction seal for the, the ball in the socket. So the ball goes in the socket, the labrum pinches around the, the, the ball to provide that extra stability. The labrum is a structure that goes all the way around the socket essentially. So if you think about the socket being a bowl, the labrum is this big, thick rubber band type structure that's uh, all the way around the top of the bowl. So it provides some, uh, protects the cartilage in the, in the hip, it uh, provides some stability in the hip, uh, provides some nutrition in the hip, um, and it also has pain fibers in it though. So when you have labral tears, that presents as, as pain. Patients experience that pain, the vast majority is even being in the front or a little bit on the side of the hip. Typically don't feel it in the back, although, you know, rare cases do exist. When you think about the hip being a ball and socket joint, you either have too much coverage over on the socket, and so the socket comes down and when you flex your hip up, it, it pinches against the neck of the ball, or you can have an extra bump on the ball, which you can see in these videos. So when you come to flex up, that extra bump contacts the labrum and pulls the labrum off. So this is an example of cam impingement. You have this extra uh, bone forming on the, it's called the anterolateral neck of your, 
femur, and then as you flex the hip up, that neck impinges against the labrum. The labrum is that strip of white that you see. As it keeps happening, is what you'll see here, the labrum gets torn, pulled back, but then you start having cartilage damage, and car it's called a cartilage shear injury, where the cartilage actually gets sheared off. So over time, that's why this is all a risk factor for not only the labral tear, but later arthritis. So at the time of surgery, you're actually taking down that whole area of impingement or that bump that you're seeing there, as well as fixing the labrum so this doesn't happen in the future. So this is an example of, it's called a pincer deformity or over coverage. So right there, you have that extra amount of bone on the socket side. So when you flex the hip up, you're impinging, but for a different reason. The socket is too deep, and so the neck impacts the socket that you're seeing here, and the labrum gets, instead of pulled back or displaced, it gets crushed. And so that occurs over the whole area of rim impingement or socket impingement. And then over time, as the labrum gets more and more crushed, you start to get damage to the cartilage as well. That can happen as a result of either an injury, but more commonly it happens as a result of the impingement itself, the, the deformity itself. The deformity does not occur because of an injury. The deformity occurs, um, we're learning more and more now, that's more developmental. So certain sports that we play as we're younger predispose us to it. For instance, hockey is a big one. Um, and what happens over time is if you're talking about the cam impingement or the extra bump on the ball part, uh, the growth plate overgrows in that area a little bit and you end up with a deformity. So deformity is nothing new that the patient has. The deformity is, has been there for years typically by the time that I see them. But over time, all these, all these motions, all this flexion adds up and presents as a, a, a tear in the labrum because that's the part that gets pulled off. Once the labrum gets torn, then the cartilage is exposed and you start to see cart cartilaginous injuries as well. So the whole process is a risk factor for arthritis. Um, but you typically see at least that more commonly in patients with the deformity more in the ball part of the, of the, of the ball and socket joint than the socket. A labral tear is diagnosed. Most of the time, physical examination can give you a good idea whether the patient has a labral tear as well as the history. Um, not all patients with labral tears have hip impingement. Hip impingement is mainly a radiographic diagnosis, meaning you can see the deformities on x-rays, MRI, CT scans, depending on what you're talking about. The more definitive way to diagnose the actual labral tear is with an MRI, most of the time an MRI with a little contrast in the joint to highlight the labrum, and that can show you if the labrum is torn, torn completely or not. Um, but even so, we really get the MRIs to confirm the diagnosis, not really to make the diagnosis. So, um, and the other thing the MRI will do for you is take a look at the cartilaginous damage, which is hard to assess cartilaginous damage on, at least minor cartilaginous damage on simply an exam or x-ray. Arthritis and labral tears can mimic each other. After a certain age, the vast majority of us will have arthritis that will present in, the in a similar manner. Now, what age is that? It's, it's hard to say, but typically a 60-year-old with a good-looking cartilaginous surface, meaning no arthritis and a labral tear, is rare. We do see it, um, but it's rare. Most of those patients by that point at least have some arthritic changes. And that's a different, they may have a labral tear associated with that, but the arthritis itself, in a sense, trumps the labral tear, meaning the arthritis is the problem, not the labral tear. The vast majority of patients with impingement on the socket tend to be young females, anywhere from you know, 13 to, say, 35. The vast majority of patients with uh, called the CAM type impingement or impingement of the ball part, those are young males, anywhere from 15, 16, 17 to you know, late 30s, maybe early 40s. Uh, if you have a large CAM lesion though, because uh, some of these patients won't present until they're, they're 40, but a lot of times that's a little bit too late to actually save the hip per se.
pain can be a sharp pain. It can catch, uh, but for the vast majority of the time, it's sort of a dull ache that gets worse with activity, or worse with sitting uh, in some patients. Um, and over time, it starts to progress to sort of pain with everyday activity, not just athletic activity. There are several treatment options for labral tears of the hip. Uh, it's a little bit dictated by the deformity, but for all my patients, I will trial um, conservative measures first, i.e. physical therapy. Physical therapy can help strengthen the muscles around the hip to take pressure off of the labral tearing or take pressure off the impingement. It doesn't actually do anything for the labral tear. The only way to get the labrum to heal is through surgery, but if the patient's pain-free, well, that's all we really care about. Um, the worse the deformity is, probably the worst chance you're going to have of improving that with physical therapy alone. However, I'll, I will still do a trial of that because uh, you never know. The patients that benefit from hip arthroscopy are patients that have a history which matches that of having a labral tear, having an exam that matches that of having a labral tear, and having radiographic findings, i.e. x-ray, MRI, that show uh, a specific type of deformity, depending on what you're talking about, and as well as the labral tear. Um, if you kind of fit all those criteria and you don't have arthritic changes, well, the vast majority of those patients do very, very well. So it's going to typically be, again, your younger population, anywhere from, I'd say, 15 to 40. Um, with certainly, I certainly have had patients over that age do well with surgery, but the vast majority of the patients are kind of going to fall into that, that category. Um, the, the main thing about doing well with surgery is not only your surgical technique, because obviously you want to, I mean, you want to do a good job doing surgery, but also patient selection. Uh, you know, it's a disservice to a lot of patients that will have a labral tear on imaging, but don't really have any other findings consistent with that. Essentially, just because you have a labral tear doesn't mean that that's the cause of your pain. You kind of need everything else to match up with it as well. Well, there's two types of surgery for hip impingement for, for labral tears. There's something called open surgery and there's something called arthroscopic surgery. Open surgery, it's uh, open. It's a bigger, much bigger incision um, with more complications. Uh, some patients aren't candidates for arthroscopy because uh, either they're, generally because their socket is too deep, uh, causing too much impingement. You can't get in there safely with arthroscopy. But 99% of patients are candidates for hip arthroscopy. What I do is hip arthroscopy. I do not do the open form of the procedure. Uh, so with hip arthroscopy, there's generally two small incisions, uh, one on just the side of the hip and more in the, one in the front of the hip. And um, essentially, we'll get the patients into the OR suite, uh, have them relaxed and um, under anesthesia. And then under very gentle control, we actually have to open up the hip with something called traction. So you're hooked up to these ski boots and your, your body's totally relaxed to minimize any problems with the traction. And then under x-ray, essentially you pull the traction to open up the hip joint. So we're using x-ray to kind of see how open that space is. Essentially, with a, the hip being a ball and socket, you need to open up that space a little bit so you can get your camera and you can get your instruments in there. And once you see on x-ray that you have good visualization that you can safely get in there, well, then you start with a small incision on the outside portion of your hip, and um, it's called a spinal needle. So it's a little needle that uh, you direct into the hip using x-ray guidance, and then once you're in the hip, then you, uh, you di what we call dilating it up. So basically, you start with a little wire and then you gradually make the hole bigger and bigger and bigger into the capsule and then you put your camera in there. From that, once your camera is in there, then you have direct visualization as well as x-ray to direct your other um, needle into the joint and then slowly dilate up. And after you have both of those, we call them portals, after you have both those portals, then you take an arthroscopic knife and you connect the two portals. So you cut the capsule in the front of the hip, so now you can actually move around in the hip and do the work you need to, need to do. So it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a process to do all these things safely, um, and then um, once you have the hip capsule cut, well then you can move around almost like an open procedure, but you're just using um, 
I mean, you're using the monitors. It's kind of like a video game in a sense. So with arthroscopic surgery, uh, the recovery, it's pretty quick. The part the patients typically do not like are the first several weeks. The first several weeks you do have to be on crutches, uh, which can be problematic. The first two days are painful, but after that it gets significantly better. Um, after two, essentially two to three weeks, uh, we'll start some therapy to get you off the crutches, work on range of motion. Most people are walking normally around four to five weeks after the surgery, I'd say. Uh, you can get on a bike with no resistance right away. You can get on uh, typically a elliptical machine around six weeks after the surgery. Running is roughly about three, three and a half months after the surgery. Full return, so if, if I do these on one of the Georgetown athletes, it's going to be six months before I'm letting them back on the court, the field, whatever you're talking about. But for most of us that are you know, recreational runners, things like that, most people are very happy about around three months after the surgery. There's no such thing as cartilage injections. There's an injection you can do that a lot of patients will think is a cartilage injection where you're injecting uh, synthetic material that mimics our joint fluid. It's not cartilage. The whole idea with that is it bathes the cartilage damage in the synovial fluid to help areas in whatever joint you're talking about slide over each other smoother, which helps with pain. Now, they're not technically approved for the hip, they're approved for the knee, um, but those aren't truly cartilage injections. You can address small cartilage areas of damage at the time of surgery by something called a microfracture, where you put a couple holes in the bone and you, you, the whole idea is it forms new cartilage over this little clot of blood that forms there. It's not the same kind of cartilage that we nor normally have. It's, it's kind of like if you have a pothole in a road and you just fill that pothole with cement. Well, it's much better than what you had, but it's not as good as a new road. Um, those, all, those procedures work really well for the knee. They work pretty well for the hip, although there's not a lot of literature on that at this point. There are other procedures that are done as an open procedure uh, for cartilage um, defects, essentially. But again, that's a, that's a much bigger um, bigger surgery, bigger recovery with more complications. Obviously there's restrictions as you move through the rehab period. First two weeks are your crutches so you can't put weight on it. After that you can put weight on it um, and walk but you can't you can't um, you can't run, you can't do side to side activity. So essentially it's two weeks on crutches uh, around six weeks, most people can get on a, an elliptical machine and start working out, which is a big step. And those of us that run, that's about three, three and a half months after the surgery. From the three-month mark to the six-month mark, it's basically fine-tuning, strengthening, everything else. But the labrum is still healing, so we can't let you just go back to unrestricted activity. It's controlled activity, activities that don't put the labrum at risk. And then at six months, all restrictions are lifted. The vast majority of patients can get back to what they consider normal. Um, it also depends on how much damage is done before the actual surgery. So obviously the more cartilage damage you have, the less likely you are to get back to normal. If, it's, if patients have just the labral tear, the impingement, and their cartilage is in good shape, most of those get back to a normal lifestyle. I mean, they're much less pain than they were before surgery. Uh, some can still experience maybe a little bit of discomfort with full unrestricted activity, but the vast majority of the patients over time are, are, are essentially normal. Now, we know that they have some damage in there because we've, we've seen it, so it's not what God gave you per se, but it's a normal it's a normal lifestyle. The incisions are very tiny, so you typically have very tiny scars. You're talking about uh, maybe this big. Um, we do we don't use sutures outside of the body. We use absorbable sutures, and so it makes the scar very tiny, and they typically heal in, and you can't really even see them uh, over time. Obviously, right at first you can.
So I have a large network of therapists that I know very well and trust, not just here at Georgetown, but throughout the Washington, D.C., Virginia, Maryland area. So I always ask patients where they, where they live or where they work, and I can generally find someone that I know is a good therapist that's fairly close to them. Uh, so physical therapy is generally two days a week uh, for roughly six to eight weeks if you're treating something non-operative or operative. It's, it's some therapy for several months afterwards as you go through different stages. With non-operative management, I will see you back around six weeks after you've done six weeks of therapy to see if you're getting results. If you're getting results, uh, if you're pain-free, well, it will stop. If you're getting results but not quite there, we'll continue it on. But generally, it's two times a week. If I'm a little worried, particularly in the post-operative period, that someone's falling behind, then we'll occasionally increase it to three days a week. As far as running and preventing hip problems or coping with hip problems, there's no recommendation as far as don't run this amount, do run this amount. The, it, the literature on running and is it, does it contribute to cartilage problems, does it contribute to labral problems, it's, it's, it's pretty gray. There's some studies that show that running is actually good for the cartilage. Now obviously it, most of that is in moderation, but that's just my recommendation. I don't have any hard literature to support that. Um, but there's those of us that run seven days a week that don't have any issues, and so I would not tell them to restrict themselves. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a tough question. It's a tough question to grasp. Now, once they've had hip surgery, um, you know, it's probably better to run maybe every other day than every single day, uh, depending on the cartilage damage. But um, again, if, if the patients are tolerating them, I'm not going to hold them back.